At 22, he rewrote the laws of quantum reality with nothing but a pencil and an idea. At 33, he stood on the Nobel stage, celebrated as one of the youngest minds ever to bend the universe to mathematics. But brilliance has its price. When others stopped at equations, he asked what they meant. Could the same quantum principles that govern matter also touch the mind? Could consciousness itself be part of the equation? What followed wasn't fame, it was exile. This is not just the story of a physicist. It's the story of a man who crossed from science into something far deeper. This is the story of Brian Josephson, the genius who refused to stop asking why. If you were living in Cardiff, Wales, in the early 1940s, you'd probably never guess that a quiet boy born in the middle of a war would one day change the way we think about quantum reality. Brian David Josephson wasn't surrounded by luxury or laboratories. His father, Abraham, was a civil engineer. His mother, Minnie, managed the home. But what the Josephsons did have was a belief that ideas mattered, that learning, curiosity, and discipline could build worlds as real as any machine. And from an early age, Brian seemed to live in those worlds. At Whitchurch Grammar School, he wasn't just good at mathematics, he thought differently. Teachers noticed he'd skip steps in calculations, jumping straight to the solution. Not because he was careless, but because he'd already seen the pattern. It's the kind of reasoning you can't teach. That sense that the universe has an underlying logic just waiting to be revealed. When he wasn't doing equations, Brian was taking things apart. Radios, circuits, anything with wires. He wasn't interested in following instructions. He wanted to understand why the world worked. And that simple question, why, would eventually lead him deep into the heart of quantum mechanics. By the late 1950s, he'd earned a place at Trinity College, Cambridge to study natural sciences. And this is where everything changed. Imagine walking into Cambridge in those years, the air thick with post-war ambition, the world's best minds rebuilding physics from its foundations. At the Cavendish Laboratory, legends like J.J. Thompson and Ernest Rutherford had once redefined matter itself. Now, in the same corridors, young researchers were exploring a new frontier. Superconductivity, the strange phenomenon where electricity flows forever without resistance. Under the mentorship of Brian Pippard, Josephson found his scientific direction. Pippard wasn't just a teacher, he was a pioneer who blended experiment and theory. In this environment, Josephson's methodical mind thrived. He wasn't loud or showy. He preferred to sit quietly with a notebook, translating the mysteries of nature into mathematical form. And during his undergraduate years, a major shift was taking place in physics. A new theory, BCS, named after Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer, had just explained how electrons could form pairs and move frictionlessly through a solid. These Cooper pairs behaved as a single quantum entity, their phases locked together across vast distances. For most scientists, that was the end of the mystery. For Josephson, it was the beginning of a new one. Imagine this. It's 1962, Cambridge. A drizzle taps softly on the window of a small study. Inside, a young physicist, 22 years old, sits surrounded by papers covered in equations. His name is Brian Josephson, and he's about to predict something that will shake the foundations of quantum mechanics. At this point, the physics of superconductivity seemed complete. Ivar Gieva had already shown that electrons could tunnel, literally pass through barriers they shouldn't, confirming one of quantum mechanics' strangest predictions. But that was tunneling for single electrons. Josephson's question went deeper. 
What if entire pairs of electrons could tunnel together? Could coherence itself, the collective wave nature of the superconducting state, cross the barrier? That one idea broke every intuition about how electricity should behave. And the remarkable thing is, Josephson didn't have a lab, no wires, no cryostats, no magnets, just mathematics and a pencil. He worked quietly, line by line, following the logic of quantum mechanics wherever it led. And what he found was astonishing. There wasn't just one effect, there were two. First, he predicted that even without a voltage, a steady current could flow between two superconductors separated by a thin insulator. This was the direct current Josephson effect, a current that flowed forever, powered purely by the difference in quantum phase. But then came the second prediction, one that linked the strange world of quantum waves to the measurable reality of voltage and time. If you did apply a voltage, Josephson found that the current would oscillate at a frequency exactly proportional to that voltage. This became the alternating current Josephson effect, a precise bridge between electrical potential and quantum frequency, something that could be measured with incredible accuracy. When Josephson published his short paper, Possible New Effects in Superconductive Tunneling, in 1962, the reactions ranged from curiosity to outright disbelief. Even John Bardeen, one of the fathers of the BCS theory that explained superconductivity itself, dismissed it as a mistake. It was the classic clash, a young theorist proposing something elegant but improbable, standing alone against the weight of authority. Yet the universe has a way of siding with the truth. A year later at Bell Labs in New Jersey, experimentalists Philip Anderson and John Rell decided to test Josephson's idea. They built delicate superconducting junctions, cooled them to near absolute zero and watched for the impossible. On their oscilloscope, a faint oscillation appeared. Rhythmic, precise, undeniable. It matched Josephson's formula perfectly. The Josephson effect was real. Within months, labs around the world confirmed it. What started as a line of theory became a tool of extraordinary precision. The Josephson junction turned into a cornerstone of quantum technology, used in squids to detect magnetic fields, and later in voltage standards so stable that they redefined measurement itself. In 1973, when the Nobel Committee announced the Physics Prize, shared between Ivar Gieva, Leo Isaki, and Brian David Josephson, it wasn't just recognition of one idea. It was a declaration that quantum mechanics was no longer confined to theory. It could now be engineered. When most scientists win the Nobel Prize, the story ends there. Recognition, tenure, respect, a lifetime of lectures and citations. But for Brian Josephson, that wasn't an ending, it was a beginning. By the mid-1970s, Josephson was back at Cambridge, now both a fellow at Trinity College and a leading figure at the Cavendish Laboratory. His lectures drew students from across the university, not because he was theatrical, but because he was precise. Every word deliberate, every idea followed to its logical edge. He was still studying quantum coherence, how collective quantum states behave, but his questions were changing. He wasn't just asking what the equations described, he was asking why they described reality so well. At the time, quantum mechanics was already challenging our understanding of measurement and observation. But Josephson began to wonder whether these puzzles hinted at something deeper, a link between consciousness and physical law. He asked, could the mind itself play a role in how the universe organizes information? It was an unsettling question, one few physicists were willing to touch. By the late 1970s and early 1980s, Josephson's curiosity had taken him far beyond the comfort zone of mainstream physics. He explored ideas at the edges of science, the relationship between mind and matter, quantum mechanics and consciousness, even phenomena like intuition and creativity that defied direct measurement. To Josephson, this wasn't mysticism, 
It was the same impulse that had driven his earlier work, to follow logic wherever it led, even past the boundaries of accepted theory. But the reaction was swift and divided. Some colleagues saw a pioneer still searching for coherence in a bigger system. Others thought he had crossed into speculation. When Josephson spoke at conferences about parapsychology or consciousness studies, eyebrows rose. Funding committees hesitated. Even in interviews, journalists framed his ideas as a fall from grace, the Nobel laureate who had strayed into pseudoscience. And yet, Josephson didn't flinch. He argued that scepticism was vital, but so was open-mindedness. To him, science wasn't a fortress of certainties. It was a process of continual questioning. He often said that to deny inquiry into unexplained phenomena was itself unscientific. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, Josephson continued to publish and to teach. He participated in consciousness studies conferences, collaborated with philosophers, and engaged with psychologists on the limits of human perception. His tone shifted. Less about equations, more about understanding. He was no longer asking how superconductors worked, but how understanding itself worked. Media attention followed, but often for the wrong reasons. Headlines focused on controversy, the Nobel physicist who believes in telepathy, ignoring the nuance of his inquiry. Still, at Cambridge, Josephson remained a respected academic. Students who worked with him recall his remarkable patience and precision, his willingness to question everything, and his calm refusal to be defined by others' expectations. To some, he was difficult to categorize, part physicist, part philosopher, always rigorous, always curious. Once celebrated for breaking barriers in matter, Josephson now questioned the barriers of the mind itself,